Welcome to Bridging Gaps, the business podcast sharing the challenges and stories of fellow business owners. Hello, I'm Deborah Levitt, your host for Bridging Gaps, the business podcast. This week, I'm joined by Linda Huckle. Linda is known as LinkedIn Linda as she is the owner and founder of Linda Huckle Training, Your Key to LinkedIn. She's also a regional director for the Athena Network. Please join me in welcoming Linda to the show. Hi, and welcome to Linda Huckle. How are you, Linda? I'm really well, thank you. I'm I'm just loving the weather today. It's lovely. It's so nice to see the sunshine and a bit of warmth, isn't it? It certainly is. It it lifts everyone, doesn't it? Or it seems to, it does me anyway. <laughs> I, I think you do. I think you find that people generally seem much brighter and much just generally happier when it's sunny. And yeah. I think we all feel better for it, which well, I guess makes sense, but it's hard when we've got a lot of grey at times, isn't it? Yes, and we've certainly had a lot of that this year, it seems. <laughs> yes, we have. So, um, so Linda, you run essentially two businesses. You've got the franchise for the Athena Network, and also I'm going to call it LinkedIn Linda, but I know it's not LinkedIn Linda. It's... Um, Oh, you need to change your name. It's got to be LinkedIn, Linda. <laughs> well, it's really funny, isn't it? Because LinkedIn, Linda came out um, purely by mistake. Well, not mistake, but I suppose it was a coincidence. I was, I was actually at an Athena meeting with all the regional directors for the Athena network. And I was talking about LinkedIn and about the various things within the meeting. And uh, uh, Jacqueline Rogers, who's the franchisor for the Athena network, said, oh, LinkedIn Linda. And the name sort of stuck. And now everybody seems to know me as LinkedIn Linda, but actually... The business is called Linda Huckle Training because I do more than just LinkedIn. Um, uh, but uh, it's your key to LinkedIn is that the second uh, strap line. And that's what I use when I'm talking about my LinkedIn training services. Well, do you want to tell people a little bit about what you do with Linda Huckle Training then, you know, the LinkedIn pieces and the other aspects that you do? Sure. OK. Um, so LinkedIn Linda. <laughs> uh, I The Linda Huckle Training part of it, um, I help businesses uh, to really use LinkedIn as, as a tool for uh, their marketing, for their communication. And actually, it's it's an amazing tool, but people don't know necessarily how to use it. They think just because they've got a profile, then that's it. And it, they tend to sit very static. So I actually help people to really use LinkedIn in terms of all of the little features that there are in there, some of which people aren't even aware that they're there. So actually, one of my clients said to me, you know, Linda, you don't know what you don't know. I had no idea that there was all of this here. So it's wonderful when I'm working with people and they can see suddenly that's how I can use it. And the penny drops, the light bulbs pop. It's great. And I think that they're right in terms of you, you don't know what you don't know. And if you're using it at, you know, you're using the features and things that appear obvious to you. Yes. You've got no idea what you're missing out on and um, and what might be beneficial for you. And I, I think a lot of tools these days, um, they, they almost try too hard in some ways. And, and it, it's it's working out those little bits that you go, OK, I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need. Oh, you are what I need. Yes. Um, and being able to find those and having somebody who can take you into those ones that are really going to make you know a difference to you I think is a huge benefit so so how did you get into being LinkedIn Linda (laughs) apart from attending a meeting start um I think it's mainly it was from I used to work at a local university um and I used to work in their staff development team 
and they were going through quite a lot of restructure at the time that I worked there. And I was asked to do uh, some CV and interviewing skills workshops to help people who are leaving to find new roles. You know, they're very supportive. And part of that, uh, it was it was fairly early on with LinkedIn. Um, I suppose it started in about 2009 when I started really getting into understanding what LinkedIn could do. So I developed a workshop for people at the university to use LinkedIn in order to find a new role. So that was where I first started. Um, and then when I made the decision to uh, leave and to set up my own business, of course, LinkedIn was part of that. And I used LinkedIn to be able to communicate with others, uh, to be able to do everything that I'm teaching people to do now with LinkedIn. Um, and I was doing other things when I left uh, the university. When I set up my own business, I was uh, going into doing people development uh, because that really is a big part of my uh, expertise. But the more that I networked with people, the more I realized actually LinkedIn was the missing bit that they needed to know and understand, especially small businesses and solopreneurs. So I developed a, a series of workshops initially for people to come to and quickly realized what people really need is individual coaching. They needed to look at LinkedIn from their own perspective. So I started to do more individual work one to one uh, with them where I could really get into and understand their business to be able to help them to use LinkedIn in the best way for their business, rather than do a generic workshop. So that's really how I got into uh, talking about LinkedIn and to training people. And training's in my blood. I've done training for a long, long time now. Well, and have you found that, you know, because for me, LinkedIn always felt initially, especially in its early days, that it was a little bit about communicating with people, but not many people used it to, you know, you could ask a question to your network and things, but not a lot of people use that. And it was more almost of an online CV. Wow. And and, and now it's it's definitely shifting to being more of a business tool and to being, you know, a range of things. So have you found that from those university days when you were helping people to essentially use it to help them find, um, you know, other jobs and things like that, to now working with smaller businesses and solopreneurs, that that what what they need to focus on and what they need to do is maybe different to the person who's doing a job search? Oh, absolutely. Completely. It's so funny, you know, because I when I first started training uh, LinkedIn, there used to be a tool in LinkedIn where you could upload your CV from Word straight into LinkedIn. And it would convert it into your experience section. Oh, that's completely that isn't the way that you do it at all now, because it really isn't an online CV, even if you're job searching now it's all about you the person who you are it's your personal brand so whether or not you're using it as a job search tool or whether or not you're using it um, as a business tool that's what it's about it's about telling and sharing with the world who you are why you're doing what you're doing and showcasing your expertise your expertise and do you find when you're when you're looking at other people's profiles and things do you find that most people are missing that point um, and, and still using it as a CV or are people starting to make that transition? I think it does depend on the, uh, the, the set of people I'm working with. There's still a lot of people out there who are still employed who are still using it as a CV tool. And actually certain categories of businesses are still using it in that way, um, in particular, I suppose accountants uh, tend to say, this is where I've worked, this is what I've done, without having any real understanding of how they can use it um, in, in their business or whether they're employed 
in a larger accountancy firm, how they can use it to help the marketing message. But a lot of smaller businesses are now understanding and getting the message, but there's still certain things that, for example, a lot of people still write their LinkedIn profile in the third person. So, or they'll write about we rather than I. Um, so there's a lot of that that needs changing. Um, so that, that that's what I actually include a lot of and give people feedback on and help them to really promote themselves. And it's difficult though talking about yourself, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. And, yeah. and, and I think with small businesses, and this is something that I know – I thought hard about when I started is especially if you've come out of a corporate environment, even though what your goal is, is to leave that corporate environment behind. There's almost a mindset, I think, that is, if I'm going to be successful, I need to be big. Um, and, and therefore, if I talk about I, I'm going to come across as a small company. And therefore, I need to talk about we. And, and and I know and, and I, I know other people who've gone through this as well as it, it is almost, a, you know, no, I need to be big and then accepting that actually it is me. Um, mm -hmm. And whether I work with other people or not, what I'm talking about is me and, and, and that it's fine to say I because the people that you want to work with are going to recognize that and value it. And, you know, they're not looking for a big corporate. So there, there's almost a mental, in my opinion anyway, um, a mental state where we're trying to leave something behind, but we're also still viewing that as the only way to success. And you've really got to do some changes in your mindset to go, no, actually, it is me. It is I. And I can be successful without being the corporate. That's right. Yes, absolutely got that in a nutshell. Um, and I think... Um, this is, this is something that I think we all do. I mean, when I came out of my employment and set up as a new business, again, I had some advice actually from quite a respected business, business coach who said, you don't talk about I, you talk about we. And actually, it's the opposite that's true because people... Here we go. This is this is such a, a cliche, I suppose, but people buy people. And you are right for some people, but you're not right for others. So let's show people who you are. Let's let's talk about I, what is your motivation? Why are you doing what you're doing now? And that's how I train people to use LinkedIn um, on their personal profiles as a company profile where we can talk about the company. That's different. But let's talk about the person because the personal profile is exactly what it says. It is a personal profile and it's about you, I. It's not about we or the company. Yes. And I, and I know I've seen less of this recently, but some people who have put their name as essentially their name, but with their, their company name and after it or something. And I'm thinking, no. That's again, I, I want to speak to Linda. I don't want to speak to Linda, you know, Huckle Training. I, I want to speak to the individual if I'm looking at your personal profile rather than than the business. And obviously you need to choose what you're willing to share and what you want to put up, you know, there. But it, it's still, uh, well, personal, as you say. It is personal, yes. It's really um, the way I think of it is it's your shop window, people can see you and yes and you need to you need to put some things on there that people are going to engage with where are your personal values and let's 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 show let's be authentic and let's talk about us as a person or me as a person <laughs> and and it is quite you know I know I resisted for quite a long time to actually put my picture up um, and, and then I did eventually put it on LinkedIn, but I still had Facebook as being more personal. And I had a picture of myself and my brother when we were little. And and I really liked it because we were just giggling. You could tell by looking at the picture that we were just giggling over something. And then I remember somebody saying to me, oh, 
oh, I've just realized we were chatting on Facebook, but I didn't realize it was you because, of course, he couldn't recognize the picture. And then when I interviewed Penny Power and she said, again, it's your shop window. I said, OK, I give in. I guess I'm going to have to change the picture. <laughs> yes. And I think it is that sort of going, OK, no, people want to know me and and people want to know who they're talking to. So as you say, in LinkedIn or whatever medium you're using, mm -hmm. it is having that it, it's me and you can see who you're talking to. You can learn a bit about me and you can either go uh, not for me or, oh, gosh, yeah, that really I, I relate to that. Yes. Yeah. And do you know, that's exactly the key point uh, that you've made there is as long as the photograph and obviously it needs to be an up-to-date photo of you um not when i was four <laughs> <laughs> or even when you're 21 <laughs> uh, you've got to be recognizable people want to be able to recognize you you need to be looking at the camera you need to be smiling um and there needs to be just you in the photo and rather than you and your partner or you and uh, a drink, for example, definitely not. <laughs> and some one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people will make is that they will put on um, uh, what do you call them, like, like a, a cartoony type face. Oh, an avatar. That's it. Yeah. Of themselves. Well, you still can't recognize that person or a logo. Um, no, it's that that the profile photo is about you. And the worst mistake is not to have a photo at all, because then, of course, nobody knows who you are. So when you're sending a connection request, how do you know who it is that's trying to connect with you? You don't. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, the reality is that you do get some odd requests. Oh, yes. Um. <laughs> So so having a picture at least helps. And then looking at the other information, you can go, oh, I know we're not going there. <laughs> um, or, oh, OK, actually, yes, uh, I can see you. I do remember meeting you and um, it makes a big difference. Yeah. So when you when you're working with people, do you find that there's any commonality in terms of the challenges that they're facing? Um, you know, are, are they you know, could you could you kind of say, OK, yeah, actually, I'm pretty sure they're going to have problems with these three things. Or is everybody different in that you've got to, to find what their specific challenges or what specifically is going to work for them? I think one of the, the most common things is that people uh, know about LinkedIn, but they don't know and understand how they can use it for their business. Um, and there is little understanding too about how a profile should be written and so I suppose those two are the biggest uh, difficulties or challenges that people face along with the fear a lot of people are just frightened they don't they feel that if they put something out there then they're going to expose their um uh, inadequacies I suppose really is would be the right word so yes those three do tend to be the most common that, that I come across however of course everyone is different so that, that's why it's so important to have a conversation with them before I do any sort of training with anybody there is a conversation to find out exactly what their business is about where their difficulties are and that's why I like working with people one-to-one -one, because you can really nail it and you can really see them engage. Whereas when you're in a group situation of nine or ten people, um, you can't. You can't you can't do that. Well, and I think the other thing is that when you're you know, so right now with the world we live in today, there is so much information available. So whether we go to a group class, whether we go to a webinar, whether we go to a networking thing where there's training, um, you know, whatever form it takes, or you've just searched on Google and you've looked it up, on, you know, found a YouTube video, there's so much information. And, and, and there's a limit, I think, to what we can take on. And, and and it's a danger of, OK, I can go and I can watch multiple LinkedIn videos and I can attend this course over here and I can do this. But 
everybody will have a slightly different perspective. So, you know, the first person will say, you know, you should do it this way. And then the second person will go, never do that. Always do this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of them will leave you with this kind of, well, a to-do list um, that one way or another, you've got to choose which of those people you're following. And now you still got to update your profile and you still got to start using it. Whereas I would imagine, or I'm assuming possibly incorrectly, that, you know, when they're working with you, that you're actually helping them to put it in place, that you're actually saying, yeah, let's start implementing this. And, and it starts happening rather than at the end of, you know, the training with you that you wave goodbye and um, say good luck. <laughs> yeah. I, um, the way that I do work, you're, you're absolutely right, is that that is how I work with people. So they always make sure that they are supported throughout the training. So we're doing as we are learning. So we're implementing the learning immediately. Some people don't particularly like that approach. And I've had a few where they just want to learn and they're making notes so they can take it away to put into practice. So it's a question, obviously, as a trainer, what you would do is you would tailor your approach, you would tailor to their learning style. And it's not too many actually who like to take things away and then implement it afterwards most people will prefer to learn and implement as we go along and some people really like uh, hand holding so we do everything at a slow step which does mean obviously that it takes a little more time however we've got to adapt to how the the person learns and I think that is really key because we, we all learn in different ways and what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for the other. And, and again, that's the benefit of doing it one to one is that you're able to, to tailor your style to, yeah. to work with them. And, and as you say, some people will want hand holding. They'll want you there, you know, every step they take. Others will want to charge off and try it. Um, and then come back and say to you, you know, look, and you'll go, OK, well, maybe we'll tweak this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's what happens. And I do do a lot of uh, support after the training has ended. And I'm not saying that group workshops don't work because I think they do in certain circumstances. So, for example, I'm going to be doing one in in uh, about three weeks' time, but that's for people who've learned LinkedIn with me, and they are ready to to do some more activity, which might help when they're with other people so that they can bounce ideas off each other. So that sort of circumstance is great. But I think when you're first learning and putting it into practice, then individual one-to-one -one sessions work brilliantly. And I think the only time really when I prefer not to do one-to-one -one is when I'm working with companies and I'm going into a company where we it's the same company, but it's a team of people. Right. So that will work well when it when it's a small group. And it is about getting that size right, isn't it? A group that you've got enough, you can give everybody attention. And if they've got a shared objective, I can see that that group session working very well. Yes. So, so Linda, you you know, you've alluded to the fact that you were doing, um, you know, working at a university before, but I think prior to that, you were working in an IT company as well. So you've actually gone through, you know, an evolution in your employed career, as well as in what you're doing um, as a, you know, as a business owner. <laughs> Rather a, a, a diverse career history, uh, actually. I mean, I first started training when I used to work for BT uh, years ago before I had the children. And in BT, they were just introducing computer uh, computers into their uh, sales uh, organization. And so I was amongst the first trainers to train people how to use uh, the BT systems using a computer instead of hand handwriting out sales orders and giving physically giving them to the engineers. That's how <laughs> that's how I started. So that's I suppose that's where I first really started getting to grips with with computers. And obviously, after the family came along, uh, I I took a break and I did various things 
including, of all things, dental nursing, completely different to how I am <laughs> now. But the dental nursing came about because I needed a part time job that would fit in amount with the children's school hours. And the dental uh, the dentist used to live opposite me. So it was easy. I could just pop across <laughs> what I needed to do and then be back in time to pick up the children from school who were at the school at the end of the road. So it was it worked brilliantly. But um, in terms of the IT training, uh, I didn't work for an IT company. I worked for adult education. Right. So I did uh, training with, used to call them recycled teenagers, basically pe uh, retired people who'd never <laughs> used <laughs> Recycled teenagers. I haven't heard that <laughs> The reason we called them that is that, of course, they were full of fun and they were they were quite challenging, but in different ways to teenagers. Um, yeah. And uh, so I taught I taught them how to use Skype, uh, how to send emails so that they can communicate with their grandchildren. Others, uh, how to type a simple letter. And uh, I'll never forget one of the very first courses I was showing people how to use the mouse and I said, and this was a big learning point for me, I said, now move the mouse across the screen and they physically picked up the mouse in the hand and moved it across the screen, literally. <laughs> so big learning point for me, demonstrate, show, ask, and then let them practice. So it's little, little, little steps and that lesson has always stuck with me, actually. Um, even now, when I see some people when they are training uh, in IT skills or anything, how they would suddenly reach across and pick up the mouse for themselves, which is, you know, it's you're invading people's personal space by doing that. So it's always demonstrate using your own device and then... Yeah people can then use their own mouse to to do something for you um and i think training is a real skill and i was so lucky you know because i had i had some fabulous training i actually trained uh down at camberley adult education center and i was doing this in the evenings and on the saturday when then obviously the children were being able to be looked after by their dad um and i learned to train people to use IT and that's what my qualification is in uh, that that particular qualification is in so you know if that that's from early beginnings going into uh, into adult education and then moving over to the university initially as a full-time IT trainer okay. the first three years I was there so yeah so it's yeah it's interesting how how things go <laughs> yeah and, and how they evolve and, yeah. and and the things as you say that you take forward with you to to remember um because I know I did some training um you know a long time ago and it's exactly that of what you think is obvious no matter how much you think you're not using jargon there's mm -hmm. still things that we just know and you forget that somebody else doesn't just know it. So, so having that memory of, I'm not going to tell you to move your mouse across the screen because I've realized that you will physically try and move your mouse yeah. um, <laughs> um, is really important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you started up um, for yourself, how did you find that? How did you find coming out of, you know, having been employed in various guises, um, you know, throughout and with the children, how did you find the the move into being your own business and essentially, you know, you're, you're now selling yourself, you're selling your skills, you're you're trying to put yourself out there. How did that go? Oh, my word. Do you know, it was a huge learning curve. It really was. I and mean, I felt that I prepared for it quite well because I knew I was going to be leaving the university um, and started putting things together before I left so that it would give me make sure that I was well prepared so I was basically I uh, went down to part-time at the university so that gave me a couple of days a week when I could focus on setting up the business 
And I did a lot of networking um, early mornings, usually, so that I could then go in and do a full day's work at the mm -hmm. university. And that seemed to and that was interesting because I learned a lot about networking as well in the, that in that year before I actually left. But oh, my goodness, the learning. Oh, my word. To suddenly and I had a team of people around me at the university. I had people who would do my admin, actually, who would prepare my training notes, who would do my advertising within within a certain area i'd never had to go out and find people before so a big learning curve unfortunately i was i was supported by some brilliant people who i met through networking who helped me get to where i am now that very well. and how did you find um so a lot of people worry about networking or you know and I know I'm one of them I'm not somebody who can walk into a room full of people and and feel immediately comfortable and just happily wander up to people to start chatting so it, it can be quite daunting if networking isn't something that you've done and that you don't feel that it's your natural environment you know how did how did you find it when you started doing it did you you know does it just suit you um, I know, obviously, you're very good at it now, but, but were you at that point or was it, again, a, a learning curve for you to figure out how it worked for you? Yeah, I think I would say that I was quite used to networking before uh, I was able, before I came out to set up my own business. The reason for that is as a trainer, as a facilitator, you network Almost automatically, you need to be welcoming when people walk into your training room and you need to be able to have the right questions to be able to ask people to make them feel comfortable in your environment. So that was a bit of a transferable skill, really. Then going out networking with other businesses, um, I'm not saying I was nervous. I don't think I was nervous, but it is a different environment. Um, to suddenly be talking about you and what you do to uh, to be able where people were already viewing you as an expert when you were in the university uh, training people. So, yes, that that took a little bit of getting used to. Um, but I think it's interesting, actually. Um, I'm not a particularly outgoing sort of person, although people think I am. I'm actually quite introvert and I do gain, I, I actually lose quite a lot of energy by being with a lot of people all day. So I do need that time to regather and to regain uh, my thoughts. But being able to go in uh, to a networking event, I think for me, probably what I'm trying to say is preparation is important. So I was able to start off going in prepared because I already do or did a lot of that anyway. Don't think it's a natural skill. I think it's something I've learned, but without realizing I was learning it. <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> No, it does. It, it, sometimes you're you're picking up things, and it's only when you look back that you realize that actually you've progressed and you have learned. You don't, um, yes. you know, you, you tend to think, "Oh, I'm just much more comfortable with this," or it goes much more smoothly. You're not consciously recognizing the things that you're doing differently that that have made that happen. So, yeah, yeah that's it. So, I think it is definitely. Um, so my background is definitely a transferable skill. Even if you look back. To the dental nursing days part of my role was to help people make make people feel comfortable that's true yes so that also translates to what I'm doing now and so that's interesting because when I was doing training and I was doing classroom training um in in IT and in you know word and excel those types of things mm -hmm. and I never I never felt, you, you know, the, as you've said, you know, I was there, I was running the course, I knew what I was doing, I was welcoming people, I was making them feel comfortable. And I've never thought about that in relation to networking, mm. and that that I could apply that kind of skill to that environment. It never, 
crossed my mind. And I don't know if it's just because it is so far in my past. Um, or if it's just that I viewed the networking as something different and, and hadn't really made a correlation between it. But, mm -hmm. but as you say, it is actually, no, I, I do know how to do that and, and, you know, maybe can use some of those skills. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say to people who, uh, well, actually, I'm going to backtrack a second. So obviously, one of the things that, that you did as well is you took out the franchise um, for the Athena Network. Yes. And um, for those who don't know who are listening, Athena is a network of um, women who meet and have a lunch every month, share learning around, you know, how to network, share learning around what they do and look at how they can support one another, not necessarily through giving each other business. So that happens as well, but just through supporting them to, you know, to work together and to build their business. Um, so. Linda, how did you come to that decision, you know, from that training background mm -hmm. um, and then doing the networking that actually taking on the Athena franchise was something you wanted to do? <laughs> yeah. OK, the way that I did it is uh, I needed support as a, as a business owner myself when I first started. So I think we're going back about just over five years ago now. Um, and I wanted to find a network in my area that would help me to learn and develop and grow, not just um, to uh, be able to share about my business. I mean, that's important, too. But I wanted to learn and develop and grow as a businesswoman. So I found the Athena Network. There was a local, sorry, not a local, there was a there was a <laughs> honestly there was <laughs> there was a, a, a group the Athena network in another town which wasn't very local to me um so I thought well let me go and try this out and let me see what it's about I couldn't find anything near me so I went and I visited and I absolutely loved the concept where learning and development training was the focus of the meeting rather than uh, this is about me, this is about my business. It was, it was more empowering for me to be in that environment. And it's something obviously I've been used to. And I thought, oh, this is fabulous. So I phoned up the franchise owner and I said, I can't find a uh, any groups in my area can you tell me is there one I just can't find it on your website and she said no we haven't got any are you interested and I sort of thought oh possibly so she arranged anyway we arranged to meet up and I met uh, I met her Jacqueline Rogers this is who's the franchise uh a franchisor for the Athena Network so I met up with her and her background is so similar to my background. You know, we just got on like a house on fire. So I, she invited me to go and visit her group in Beaconsfield so that I could see how she, as a franchise owner, runs her groups. Oh, my word. And it, I, it was just right for me. And I knew then that it would be right for me to run myself as a, as a facilitator of learning and having to wanting to bring that to the women in my area, so that's Farnham, Fleet and Camberley, Farnborough, Oldershot, all of the towns around my area. So that's what I decided to do. And it was a risk. It was a risk. Obviously, a franchise is an investment. And so I did invest in it. We had some really, really fabulous training and met the other regional directors. There's so much support from the other regional directors that you are, you're getting that already. You know, you, you're already in that right mindset. So bringing it to Farnham, which is the first, the first group, and I launched my group with eight members. And now I've got four groups and each group has got between 15 and 24 members and it, they, it, it has been so successful and I absolutely love it. 
it's it's great and it's pe seeing people like you deborah uh who are and i know you're a member of one of my groups but it's seeing how people come in and how they thrive and how they develop and how they gain confidence and how their businesses grow and i've got people being with me right from the beginning and they have, they've all said it's the best business decision they've made, not because it's a way to sell to each other, but because it's it's very supportive, very collaborative. So many alliances that happen, strategic alliances, and their business is growing. And it, it's it's brilliant. It's lovely to see. It really is. And I know when I... Um... Well, so I'd heard about Athena for, you know, however long I'd known about it. But I, you know, everybody's got different experiences, don't they? And, I, and I'd kind of heard some things that just made me think, oh, I don't know if it's right for me. Um, and then when I came along to to your group, to the, the Camberley group, I do remember thinking, actually, this is really, you know, lovely. And it was a range of different sizes of business, um, you know, solopreneurs, you know, companies with, you know, multiple employees, that sort of thing. And just a really friendly, welcoming environment. So I think sometimes it is getting past those initial perceptions um, and also realizing that not every networking group is for everybody that, you know, the way you know, I work and the way things that work for me aren't necessarily the things that will work for somebody else who I might know and like and work well with, but the networking groups are different. So, um, yeah, I think Athena does have something which is, you know, very lovely and very supportive and, um, and it's good. So you're obviously, you know, networking is a part of your everyday life. Um, from all different angles what kind of tips would you give to people who are you know just starting out networking or who are worried that they're not good at it and are, are scared of going you know what what are the you know top tips to say here's what you need to do <laughs> well, actually, I'll, I'll share a top tip actually I've shared very recently on um, on LinkedIn and uh, that is if you are worried about it then be early at the meeting so arriving early will give you that perhaps 15, 20 minutes with the organiser. And then as people are arriving, the organiser already knows you and can introduce you to people as they arrive. So it's not so daunting when you turn up and it's just you and maybe one or two other people. Whereas if you walk in a little bit late, which some people sit in the car park. I've seen them. Some people sit in the car park and they're plucking up the courage to come in. That's more daunting because you're walking into a room full of women who perhaps already know each other and they've already met each other and they're already in conversation. So how do you get into that? Being early means that you're in at the right at the beginning. And that really helps. And um, another one is, again, it's the fear factor. I've, I've heard people say, I'm worried about standing up in front of other people. I'm worried about talking about my business in front of other people. It's the confidence factor. What I would say is find a group that works for you. And uh, whether you're male or you're female, finding groups where they will help to give you the skills and give you the confidence to stand up walking in that door is the probably the most daunting thing that you will do for the first time once you're in as long as the group is right for you and is giving you the right support non-judgmental supportive um and that makes you feel welcome then you can then make a decision whether or not it's right for you and I've heard some real horror stories. I've heard people who've come to my group, actually. One, one lady came to me, she said, I, and obviously it, it's unprofessional for me to say which group, but the uh, lady had walked into another group and had been criticised for how she was giving her 60 seconds speech. We call it monthly minute in Athena, but she was criticised by other people um she, you should have said this you should have said that you know you need to stand up you need to speak more clearly well they might have thought it was feedback 
but actually it came across as criticism. And she went out almost destroyed and it took her all her courage to come to Athena. And she's now been, she's just renewed for a third year. So it, it, it shows, doesn't it? It's the environment that matters. So finding the right environment is, is key. And, and I know for me personally, I realized early on that the unstructured where, you know, basically the networking is people going into a room, there's drinks, possibly nibbles, and people are just what I call milling round um so they're just you know it's unstructured there's no formality and I found that for me that didn't work that I felt very uncomfortable um that I wasn't very good at inserting myself into a conversation um and that I'm much more comfortable and I think more successful in the networking if I go to something with structure. So, so something where there might be some, you know, there might, there's free time chatting at the beginning of the end, wherever, but there's also a point where, you know, you sit down and, and there's some formality around it. Um, and, and so I recognized that fairly early on and therefore made a point of saying, okay, well, those are the types of things that I'll go to um, and then trying different ones out as well. Because yeah. as you say, it is, it's about a fit for you. And, and I know, you know, there, there's one group that, um, you know, I've heard so much about and, and I've heard a huge amount of negativity around how it's run. Um, you know, this is a, a particular networking. It's, it's, it's not Athena, it's just a networking um franchise I guess as well but then I've heard from other people who absolutely love it and are hugely successful in it and and who it's been incredibly supportive for and really helped them to de deliver and develop mm -hmm. so again it's that I think the personality is in the network itself yes. um, of the one that you're going to and and the giving it a chance to see if it's a real fit makes a big difference it does and actually this is what we um, train our members in um is we we have uh, at every meeting we have something called networking strategy training and what we do as regional directors across the athena network is we will have uh, some small topics it's only about 10 minutes in every meeting but in each topic it's it's when you bring all of these skills together that we're training people to do it can help them to network both in structured meetings or in unstructured meetings. And we give people the opportunity to practice those skills, as you'll probably find out at the next meeting where I'm actually looking at informal networking. <laughs> and it is, you know, how do you break into a conversation? How do you bring in other people into a conversation? How do you, let's call it work the room, how do you, get the confidence to leave a conversation to move on to another group so all of that are skills that we train our members to use so that they can take these networking skills out and it's so funny because whenever I go out networking with people I've not met before you can always tell those who are Athena members because of the way that they're doing it oh right yeah it's very interesting to watch and it's taken me a little while to realize this is happening. And so sometimes I go up and I'll say, I, are you a, an Athena member? Have I met you before? And they'll say, yes, I am. But I don't think we've met before. And you do you do see this. I was in a big function, actually, in um, in London. And it was a, an industry function, nothing to do with, with networking or with the Athena or with LinkedIn anything it was uh it was just a really interesting uh event that I went to and it was a charity event and there were two or three women there and I thought I bet they're Athena and they were <laughs> <laughs> you've now got Athena radar <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's it is great I mean yes okay networking does come naturally to others but oh my word people make such fundamental errors when they're out networking and I'm sure you recognize people who go around and shoving business cards in your hand and moving on or looking over your shoulder because you're not as interesting as the next person they want to speak to all of that we uh, we help our members to um, 
be better networkers. I think my favorite one was I'd gone to a speed networking and um, which I actually quite like. I think that they give you at least an, an internet, um, an initial introduction to them, and then you can follow up and get to know people more, you know, as, as required. But this one group that I got to, there was, um, I'm showing my age now, there was a 12 year old boy sitting across from me, <laughs> who I'm sure probably wasn't 12, but I, I could swear, you know, he looked about 12. <laughs> <laughs> there was a woman next to me and then there was me and so he went first which was fine and he talked about you know he was a google seo expert and and all of this which was great um and then i did my talk and then the woman said you know this will be each had a minute um said oh well actually i don't have anything that's relevant to either of you physically turned and looked at the young guy and said tell me more and and she you know she physically mm. moved and i just remember looking and thinking okay, I'm not necessarily, you know, the, I've spoken to lots of people that I was not interested in, but at no point did I physically ignore them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And it's always stuck in my mind as a, you know, even if I got to a point where she was somebody who I could use, I wouldn't because it was just so rude and so, um, well, inappropriate. Yeah. You know, we all had people we were speaking to that weren't relevant to us, but that was the nature of it. So as you say, you do get the interesting ones. Yes, you certainly do. <laughs> it's a learning curve, isn't it? You know, that that's that's how we learn, and that's how I did a lot of my learning um before I became a regional director myself, is I did observe some poor practice and knew I didn't want to run my groups in the way that others were. So yes. Yeah. So as you say, you're you're learning through observing and yes. um, and taking yeah. those things on. Yes. So Linda, we, we've talked a lot, you know, about you know how you work with people, the things that you've learned, and um, and some of the challenges you faced when you were moving, you know, into being, you know, running your own business. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges, and it's you know, it comes up all the time now in the news. It's very visible. It's about managing our mental health, our mental well being. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just wondering how you manage to balance, you know, the, the two different businesses that you're running, as well as I know your family is very important to you mm -hmm. and and to really just you know staying healthy in in you know mentally and physically and and happy in, in a balanced life or as as one of person I spoke to an integrated life where work and life um are are together as opposed to one overtaking the other yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll be honest, I think I probably need to improve on um, increasing the time that I actually have outside the business. But as any small business, especially when you're new or starting up, your whole focus is on the business. And it's so easy to forget and ignore everybody else around you. So I know that I need to be better in having a, a better stop time in the evenings the advantage of being of running your own business is you can start and you can stop at any time that suits you but you've got to make sure that what you do doesn't overtake uh, what you're doing um, with, with your family so it's making that conscious decision sometimes the work will be here tomorrow I need to stop Sometimes I personally actually work quite well in the evenings. I, I do find that for some reason I'm, I'm not a morning person. I'm not good in the mornings at all. Um, so I do, I'm quite productive in the afternoon and early evening. Between about three and seven is my best time for being productive, oddly enough. And uh, so that's when I do tend to do quite a lot of my um this sort of thing, working uh, and, and talking and planning and focusing on what needs to be done. In terms of the family, weekends, uh, I don't work at weekends and I won't work at weekends. Uh, it took me a long time to get out of the nine to five mentality that many, I suppose, years and years and years of being employed. It's not an easy thing to get over that. Um, I'm really in the very fortunate position of 
my husband is great. You know, he he feeds me, he cleans. <laughs> It's 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 fabulous. Richard um, uh, isn't working now. He's now taking retirement, early retirement. So although he's as busy as ever, he's off motorcycling. He's doing he get, he does target shooting. He does um, all sorts. He's a magistrate. All of that takes obviously a lot of his time. So I think having that personal interest. And then making sure that we're making time for each other uh, is is absolutely important to both of us. And of course, you know, having the family around me. And I'm again very very lucky. My son got married a month ago, so of course, yes, I had to take a little backward step from working because, of course, weddings are big. You know, they they do take a lot of your time and energy. I think it's energy they take the time it's very emotional time as well so that's why I took some time off afterwards just so that I could then come back to to work refreshed afterwards well and it's really good to to recognize those things as well because Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people you know feel that they've got to push on and that they've got to push through and that it you know that they, they just have to keep going and and I think that there are times, and it's hard to know which is which, but there are times when you say, actually, I need to stop. And the right answer right now is stop. Um, and there are other times when you do need to push through. And, and finding that balance is really difficult. Um, and, and as you said about the corporate nine to five, get, you know, so I'm, I'm the same as you. I find that I work much better. So, so in terms of when I think of starting working in the day, it is around 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, I might start earlier, but I don't put any pressure on myself to start earlier. And I'm also more productive in the afternoon, the early evening. So recognizing that and going, I don't have to be up and working at nine. Um, you know, it's not my best time. There's nothing driving me on the occasions that I need to. I do. Um, but recognizing that, I think, can have a huge difference just on how you feel generally. Yes, that's right. It does. And I think the other thing is it's important to get out during the day. If you are working as I am today in the office all day in my little office, then I need to get out at lunch times. Perhaps I'll have a walk. We've got the dog. It may take him for a walk. He's not today because he's with his uh, he's with his dog walker today. Um, but I need. Yeah, I just need to get out. And sometimes it's recharging the batteries, even if it's just a beautiful day, going and sitting, having a half an hour and reading your book and and then you can come back. So I'm not push, push, push all day. I am getting better at taking breaks when I need them. And I do need them and making sure I'm drinking enough water. Actually, I've been making a concerted effort to make sure that I'm drinking enough water to keep me hydrated because then your brain, it's it's sort of, I don't know I'd want to explain, it sort of goes, um, oh, trying to think of the right word for it, but it gets fuzzy. Yes. Yeah. So getting up, physically getting up, going and getting a glass of water rather than having a bottle of water with me works better for me rather than a lot of women I know who will have their big two litre one litre bottle next to them and will drink during the day I actually like to get up and go and get my glass and then come back again because it's a break break from the computer And, and that's true I find that I if I'm really focused on something that I won't get up and leave. And, and I often find myself that, that I realize that I'm really cold, I'm really thirsty, and, the, and that I've literally been sitting still, working on the computer or whatever, mm-hmm. um, and not moving. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, obviously my brain is working, my hands are typing or, or you know, whatever, but, but I'm not actually moving around. And then you realize that actually you're now really sore because you've been sat in this place. You're freezing cold because you haven't been generating any heat by moving at all. Um, and I haven't been drinking, even if there's a bottle sat there. So that's something which I'm still working on for me is to, is to be actually, I am getting up and taking that break. I am having that little gap. And, and as you know, I borrow a dog. And so having him is a good 
you know, well, apart from the fact that sometimes he just comes up and sits next to you and is like, you know, hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's a juggling act, though, isn't it? It really is a juggling act. And I do find that, especially with having both businesses, because obviously my Athena work and my LinkedIn work, whilst they fit quite nicely together because they're um, networking, it's the same ethos uh, with both. I do find, obviously, I have commitments for a thing that, that must be done at a certain day. You know, obviously, my meetings are held on certain days of certain months, and there are lots of other activities I need to be doing around that to help encourage uh, women to come and visit and find out about Athena for themselves equally. I've then got to do the same for my LinkedIn work, the marketing, the accounts, everything. And it's sort of a dual, a dual process constantly. So having that juggling bit as well. So I have to make sure as, that I am pretty planned. I know I've got, I actually have, I keep two to-do lists one for Athena, one for LinkedIn, and then I've got them both in front of me so I can make sure that I'm doing. Otherwise, I'm jumping from one to the other. So focusing, doing it that way helps too. And I think that it's, it's easy to forget that when we shift gears, that there is actually a delay that, you know, if you've been in this mindset and you're now swapping to this one, mm. but getting up to full speed on the second one, there's going to be a little bit of a dip and coming down and saying, actually, I'm going to try and stay focused on this and get everything done before I move over to the next topic yeah. can actually be more productive, even if it sometimes feels a bit counterintuitive. Yes. Yeah. So, Linda, just before we wrap up, is there any final thing that you want to say or anything that you want to sort of, you know, share with with people who are listening? <laughs> oh, well, um, I would like to alert um, obviously business women out there. If you're in the area, that's that's Farnham, Fleet and Camberley and the towns that surround them and you haven't yet discovered the Athena way, then please do come and have a visit. We've got a visitor's month next month, and we are encouraging people who've never experienced Athena before, come along, just try it out, have a visit, see if it's right for you. As you said earlier, it's not right for everyone, but you won't know until you try. So do come along, um, and well, we would love to see you, and obviously our members would, want to make connections with new members so we would love to see you and in terms of LinkedIn if anyone out there is in a, is a business and you're looking at LinkedIn you're thinking what's about you know am I I'm struggling with this or I really don't know what I'm doing here again do let me know and just be alert, everyone, that there's a new LinkedIn look coming very, very soon. Um, <laughs> so many changes happening in LinkedIn. It seems to be happening almost every day. But if you want to keep in touch with me or you want to follow me on LinkedIn, please do. Uh, again, I like to be able to share knowledge, hints and tips. So either have a look at my company page on uh, LinkedIn, which is just under Linda Huckle Training, or have a look at my website because I'm sharing tips and hints on there. And that's uh, key to linkedin.co.uk. And I'll be sharing those links on the um, blog page. So um, anybody who's looking can go to uh, podcast.bridginggaps.uk to find, well, all about you and the transcript as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. so Linda, thank you very much. It's been really lovely talking to you. So thank you for coming on and taking the time to chat. You're very welcome. It's been fabulous to talk to you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And we'll see you very soon. Okay. Thanks, Deborah. Bye. Okay, thanks. I've been talking to Linda Huckle. You can find out more about Linda at her website, keytolinkedin.co.uk and theathenanetwork.com forward slash Linda Huckle. All of Linda's links and mine are available on the show pages. The 
number of podcast listeners is growing year on year as people want to move away from being tied to their screens and be able to consume wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And the number of potential listeners is absolutely massive. So if you've thought about starting your own podcast, why don't you go to startyourownpodcast.bridginggaps.com Dot uk and check out what my course so you think you want your own podcast offers you've been listening to deborah levitt on bridging gaps the business podcast